Hello and welcome to the Media Podcast. I'm Matt Deegan. On the show today, is the BBC planning to take ads in the UK? Uh, we look into a curious story from the Times this week and its implications for British audio businesses. Also on the program, how's that BBC local radio strategy doing? Uh, the head of BBC England's radio stations talks to us about the next phase. And all that, plus GB News get wrapped by Ofcom, YMU tools up with new talent, and in the media quiz, we get specific. Uh, that's all to come in this edition of the Media Podcast. Podcast. In the news this week, a crack team of experts are being seconded to the DCMS to help decide the way the BBC is funded in the future. Uh, the panel includes veteran Sir Peter Basiljet, uh, Radio Centre ex-boss Siobhan Kenny, and Channel 5's first boss, David Two Brains Elstein. Uh, the media podcast hotline uh, must not have been working that day. Uh, ITV have renewed their PSB licence for another 10 years, uh, despite warnings just a few years ago that it may change course. The commercial broadcaster committed to making public service Service content for the foreseeable and as such remains at number three in the EPG across the country. Uh, Google has been fined 250 million euros in France for the way it used the country's news outlets to train its AI. It's the first test of a new EU law designed to protect intellectual property and its neighbouring rights, uh, which has allowed publishers to demand compensation for use of their content. And joining me at the London Podcast Studios to cover the other media stories of the week, uh, we welcome back the head of TV Indie Gold Waller for us, Osman. Hello. Uh, how are you? I'm all right. I'm fasting again. You did this to me last year oh, when you got me no. on the pod, and we record this just as I'm going to start eating. And now you've got Alex Farber, who has a has a habit of getting like gossip out of me. <laughs> so this is like a really dangerous, treacherous time for me because God knows what's going to happen. Where Alex is going to noodle me for something, and I don't re- before I even realise it, there's going to be some gossip that gets dropped. It's almost like it's a plan. Yeah, Ooh, um, yeah. Uh, BAFTA TV award noms announced this week. Yeah, they uh, were. Anything that caught your attention? It's going to be a bit of a tricky year because telly is in a bit of a weird space mm-hmm. right now. So you've got to be get the tone right about what you want to celebrate, but you want to celebrate it because you want to tell everybody, look at the amazing stuff we've done. So there's there's stuff that you would expect to see, Happy Valley, then there. Um, uh, the, the crown is raising a few eyebrows because I think a lot of people were less admiring. Slightly off the boil. Yeah, of, mm. of the last season of the crown, but it's done very well in, in these knobs. Top Boy has done incredibly well, as I, as I think it should do. Um, there's there's a lot of recognition to be had there. There's there's some really great new talent now. Mawan's been nominated for Juice, I think probably three times all over the place because the Craft Awards come out mm. as well, which aren't televised. Uh, Dreaming Whilst Black continues to kind of get lots of recognition that it deserves so that's that's really exciting the only thing i'd say about it is that because of the 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 nominations when the when the win- nomination window opens and then when these are, are announced and obviously when the awards happen it's quite a long time yes so it seems things, like old shows yeah so things that are conspicuously absent so there's no mr bates versus mm. the post office there's no gladiators there's no traitors you know they won last year you would expect them to be in it this year that's that's not there so there's, there's lots of things because there has been a bit of a purple patch of great shows on tv that aren't being celebrated here so it, yeah, it, there's 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 still more to come, is what I would say. There's lots more shows to recognise. Uh, and next to Fraz, we have the Times media correspondent Alex Farber. Hello. Hello, Matt. Uh, speaking of awards, uh, you've been at the Broadcasting uh, Press Guild Awards this afternoon, as have I. Uh, what were your highlights? Oh well, it was a, it was a good award. So what 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 stood out for me? There was um, Happy Valley got Best Drama Series. Um, Sarah Lancashire Best Actress, um, Best Writer for Sally Wainwright. So that did well. Mr. Bates versus the Post Office that uh, Fraz just mentioned that was recognised. They, they got a special award. I got a special Mm. award um, and it made a significant impact. There was a standing ovation. Um, Toby Jones was there. I was sat next to Joe Hamilton. Oh, yes. I was sat next to Joe Hamilton. The real Um, Joe Hamilton. The real Joe Hamilton. From the post office. Yeah, from the post office. So that was a bit of a privilege and it was nice to see them get a uh, standing ovation. The other highlight for me was uh, Andy Harries. He collected, he's um, the, again, he's the producer behind The Crown and many, many other shows. He runs... He had an amazing showreel of his sort of 25, 35 years of success, didn't he? Incredible. I mean, it felt like it went on for about 25 minutes, (laughs) but it was all killer and no filler. Mm. So, you know, he was a very big, uh, big popular winner on the night. And finally, I've got to give mention to... Uh, Russell Brand in plain sight the uh, dispatches that Channel 4 worked on with my colleagues at the Times and the Sunday Times 
I, I thought you were going to say that Russell Brown was there in plain yes. sight, and I was a bit like, that is a scoop. <laughs> that would have been quite the moment. Uh, and finally, it's our Antipodean audio correspondent and pod news editor, the perma jet lagged James Cridland. Hi, James. Good day. Uh, what's the big story in Australia at the moment? <laughs> oh, it's all about consolidation. It's all about media consolidation. I mean, it's either that or the entire country's on fire or, or underwater. Um, but uh, no, so uh, SCA and Bauer, um, SCA and ARN are uh, merging. And the reason why I say SCA and Bauer is that ARN is essentially the Bauer. Uh, mm. SCA is, is essentially the global. Both of those organizations are uh, merging. The two big radio companies are merging uh, together. And that's going to be absolutely fascinating. And is to that going to happen? Because there's always some discussions about will it pass the rules? Is this the general view that that, that thing is going to happen? Yeah, the general rule is that um, it'll pass the rules in terms of the media ownership uh, laws. The way that they're doing it is they're splitting into two uh, companies, which may sound familiar to us here in the UK. Um, there will be um, uh, whatever this new company is going to be called, which will own half of the licenses, because you're only allowed to own two licenses in each uh, radio market. Um, Another radio company will own the other two, but will be presumably licensing brands uh, and that sort of thing. And they do an interesting thing of sort of merging their digital operations. Yes. So you've sort—it sort of from the outside, it sort of looked like a clever sort of semi-clever wheeze to get around the old analog rules, whilst sort of being merged together for the digital future. Yes, I mean, I think the question at the moment is who will win? Will it be um, will it be iHeart, which is essentially a licensing deal um, for the iHeart brand uh, in the in Australia? Will that be the predominant brand that wins, or will it be the listener brand, which is a homegrown brand that uh, SEA has put together? Now, SEA's done all of the tech for that, so that's interesting and exciting, and it's something that they own. But is the iHeart brand stronger? So it'll be interesting seeing who wins there. And you've got an interesting situation where iHeart, the American sort of audio digital brand, licensed to Australia, as you say, mm -hmm. and owned 15% by Global in the UK. Yes. So that could end up being <laughs> the thing that's everywhere. Yeah, well, I mean, it could well be. Maybe global will actually be go global by name and global by nature. Yes, we will see. Uh, right, so let's start with one of Alex's stories. Uh, this week it was revealed that the BBC is making plans to feature advertising on its audio output uh, when distributed on third-party platforms. Uh, Alex, tell us more. Yeah, this is an interesting and quite somewhat quite surprising um, story. The BBC traditionally... Um, almost exclusively funded by the licence fee as well as some commercial sales and as part of that um, commercial income it's going to start running adverts around its uh, radio shows and on-demand um, radio programmes on when they appear on third-party services. Such so these as, are things like Apple or Spotify? Yeah this isn't so you'll still be able to get all the shows ad-free on BBC Sounds it's worth saying but nevertheless they think that um, audiences are sufficiently familiar with adverts on those platforms and that they will not be out of key filter for them to also hear adverts on BBC podcasts, which, you know, is quite um, a departure from a traditionally non-ad non -ad environment. For as I saw this and went, have they gone entirely mad? Did you? Yes. See, I thought I saw this and was a bit like, that's completely common sense to me. BBC plus ads in no, the UK. I, see, I, see, I think that what it shows is the BBC acknowledging that actually where we would used to think about things being geo-blocked. So, you know, if you wanted to listen to this show, the only way to listen to this show in the UK was to watch your TV or watch or listen to your radio in the UK. And then BBC America has ads on it. And when you go elsewhere and you see the same shows that you see from back home, mm. and suddenly they've got ad breaks in it. And obviously because they've sold it elsewhere. I think now you look at other platforms that exist, it doesn't really make much sense why, you know, the, the, the podcast platforms that, you know, I don't use... Um, well, I use BBC Sounds when I want to listen to BBC stuff, and then I use Overcast when I want to listen to podcasts. Why is it that that, that app doesn't have adverts in mm. it when it's obviously not siloed in the walled garden of, of the BBC? So but, I, I kind of think it, it makes sense. You want to listen to stuff free? Listen to it on BBC Sounds. That's not available outside of the UK. And this is allows and protects the value of um, of the and well, the, the exclusivity to public service what about watching BBC One on Sky people TV? are shaking their heads all around well, me they're well, like no 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 no, 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 no. I, what have they done I want to tell you this. what about watching BBC One on Sky, Sky TV exactly no because I think that that is different because you're that's not a you can't take you can't download 
Sky TV. Well, you can actually, well, but like, I think, I think it is. I do think it's it's significantly different because that is a that's a carriage thing. Whereas this is just an RSS feed that you can just pull from anywhere. And but a listener doesn't know the difference. They just assume in the is, UK they but don't. But like first run, this is like first run audio um, that's that's on sounds and on on Radio Four. And if you happen to use Apple Podcasts, you're going to get ads in it. Don't yeah, you think don't that listeners see, will find that a bit weird? I, I don't... Well, no, because they obviously they do so much promotion to push you to BBC Sounds anyway mm. as an app. That's, that's obviously part of the strategy of why they're mm. doing this. Um, but but I, think, I think the difference between the, the Sky analogy and, and what's happening here is, is that there is, a, there is a fluency that we have that when you're watching something like Sky or Virgin Media or, or the BBC or Terrestrial, all of those are UK things that are done in UK households. When you look at Apple Podcasts or Overcast or Pocket Cast mm. or, whatever, or Spotify, the same system is being used all around the world. Yeah, but, 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 you, they've, but, you, but, they, but they've already had ads in the, uh, you know, outside of the UK on podcasts for a long, long time. So this is, oh, the, see, so not, this that, is the that, first that change. Okay. So this is the first change from my point of view is all of a sudden we're getting ads on BBC content, first run BBC content in the UK for the first time. I think the Sky thing is, is absolutely right. I'm quite excited about what it means for open RSS. Yeah, so you, you, I, I've heard you sort of say this over the last 24 hours. Now, this takes a slightly different view. So uh, there are some people in the podcast space that haven't been big fans of the BBC um, putting its content exclusively on BBC Sounds. And there's a worry that from some that, that there'd be more of that and it wouldn't be on mm. Apple and Spotify. I mean, there's, so there's a trial uh, on at the moment, which means that the news quiz, which uh, I would remind you all is a topical news quiz, uh, is delayed by one month on Open RSS. Now, when I was at that corporation, um, a trial had an end date. This does not have an end date. I've asked the press office for or five times what's the end date for this for this trial and they say oh it's just it's just ongoing well that's not a trial that's a policy but if you if you look at um, what this might mean this might mean that you know I, I calculated if you assume six ads a podcast um, which is typically what most podcasts out there run that's 90 pounds per thousand listens so if you get a million downloads that's 90 grand on Apple podcasts and nothing on BBC Sounds. So which are the BBC going to promote? BBC Sounds, where they earn nothing from it, or 90 grand, which is not a but can I, small so, amount can of money. I, so this might be a bit of confusion from mm. my part. And it's interesting you say about the news quiz. I stopped listening to the news quiz mm. for that very reason, because it started to get delayed on, on my third party app, and mm. I just fell out of habit with, yeah. with listening to it. So there is a, there is a problem there. But so, so just to clarify that, so does that, is what you're saying that if I download, if I have an app, uh, if I have a BBC podcast that I'm using through my third party, I won't hear ads in the UK. But if I got that feed and I was in America, it would pull in so, the American feed. So in so in America at the moment, you would get ads uh, in on the, a BBC podcast. On a BBC podcast, so that exists already. That is, oh, okay, yeah, that's, at, that's the, different. at the moment in the UK, you don't. But the plan is that you will. Uh, can I can I just say something here? I don't think the issue. Is the or is the audience experience? You know, I do think there's some familiarity with advertising around um, BBC content, not least through UK TV, right? Which is a BBC mm. owned portfolio of channels. Dave Gold yesterday, everyone watches ads on them. But that's that's out there. But it's not what first run. What the concern? That some of it is a lot of that is first run. What the concern is that I'm hearing is from the the impact that this is going to have on the podcast suppliers and producers in the industry, because this is going to be quite a distortionary effect on the market whereby there's a I think it's estimated that the advertising market in the UK on podcasts is about a 70 million pound business right now that is only going to get diluted by the BBC coming on board now the BBC thinks that they are going to help grow the pie because as a result of the big established kosher BBC coming on board that's going to encourage brands that haven't previously embraced podcast advertising to do so suppliers are skeptical and I'm hearing frustration nervousness from 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 uh, producers that they are going to end up with a smaller slice small producers that they are going to end up with a, a smaller spot slice of the podcasting spend pie because of the BBC effectively parking its tanks on their lawn and the other thing I think worth saying is in BBC BBC gets three and a half billion pound worth of license fee revenue this is going to generate a relatively small amount of money for what's potentially putting a lot of noses out of joint and I think the other thing worth saying is people are concerned that it represents the thin end of the wedge and that what this um, is a uh, the BBC dipping its toe into an advertising market that it might then seek to um, push out onto its traditional television channels. If, 
Sorry, that, that's all really. I mean, that's I've swung completely the other way because <laughs> I because I misunderstood. My understanding was yeah. out, you know, outside of the UK and on other apps, then you would see adverts. But if that's happening already outside of UK territories, mm. and yes, this is but, this but, is problems um, attached to it. I mean, uh, Alex has got a good point there. D- does this sort of queer the pitch a little bit for the BBC's license fee next round of license fee settlement? I, Have they sort of inadvertently grasped the third rail, uh, and it will? generate more issues I don't think them. the BBC does anything in adversity not really, like, not, not I, I, I think that there, there, there could I think there is mm. warrant to say that there's, this might be a bit of an experiment to see how mm. how people do take to advertising against they've been specifically content. challenged by the government with being a more commercially focused organisation yeah. yeah. the government's made no bones about that you know BBC does already have BBC Studios which generates you know um, what we're we talking about a billion billion mm. and a half yep. of revenue returns about £250 million a year revenue to the BBC. The government wants to see the BBC less reliant on the licence fee, you know, not having to ask taxpayers for more money and, you know, able to stand on its own two feet, support itself a little bit more. And it considers that this is, a, you know, a way in which it can do that. In, in addition to that, you know, what I want to know is, do producers get any of this money? Yeah. So the, the Audio UK have said the BBC's discussions are if you have a programme... Uh, that goes into this scheme, you will see a cut of that. I know that at the moment where there, that happens internationally, there is some disquiet about transparency and where the money comes from. Because in your calculations there, James, it doesn't quite take into account fill rate. No, of course. So of this course. is you can that's, ha- that's assuming that six ads have been sold in every yes. in, in every download. And of course, that's absolutely not, not the case. What I love listening to is ad funded shows in Australia where you hear and the rest is entertainment is a great is a great example you you hear them saying and now we'll take a break we'll come back um, because there's absolutely no ads sold well at, at the moment you get that in the UK as well for quite a lot of uh, rest is entertainment breaks um, because of the fill rate and the pressure on the ad market there's a bit of me that also thinks the BBC have maybe overestimated what they'll get because what they're going to take ad wise is isn't everything no, and I think you know. On the other side, they have been. They have said that um, don't worry, the B- B- BBC News will not have any ads in it. And um, I just like to remind the BBC that they run the BBC News Channel, which has ads in it outside of the UK. Uh, if ads are fine there, why are they not allowed in? You know, in the audio here. Are they in are news you, podcasts outside of the UK? Do you get ads in BBC News? Podcasts? Uh, you get ads in some BBC News podcasts, but of course, the BBC News Channel, mm. um, the TV uh, uh, channel, is chock full of ads, and there seems to be no qualms in terms of that. Why would there be qualms in terms of sticking ads uh, in there? And I heard, you know, somebody saying uh, the other day that you know we're doing it because uh, you know we're cl- we clearly need to be impartial. Well, does that mean that? that shows with ads in it aren't impartial anymore mm. no, none of that particularly makes an awful lot of sense so I'm, I'm i'm fascinated at seeing how this works but you know it's another example of the bbc jumping into i mean you know that they, they were wanting to produce a new boom radio the other the other month and it just seems to be another way of encroaching into into the commercial world where they they have guaranteed revenue from that license fee for a number of years um, um, and commercial, uh, you know, commercial media companies don't. Uh, well, speaking of news channels, Ofcom has censured GB News for its use of politicians as presenters on news programming. The move is against five separate programs, including those fronted by everyone's favourite, Jacob Rees-Mogg and Esther McVeigh. Um, GB News did not react well to, to being told that they break the rules. No, GB News basically said to Ofcom, do one. Which, <laughs> we don't care what you've got to say. We don't think we're doing anything wrong. We're not going to change course. You know, we think we're, this is a chilling development. You're sanctioning us. We're not doing anything wrong. And, you know, we, we have no intention of, of, of amending what it is. They had, that, they had that statement prepared since they, they started the channel, <laughs> yes. didn't they? They probably broke that statement before they turned the cameras on. It's like, Freedom of speech. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I saw that and because they have changed how they do things. Uh, and they've told all their staff uh, to be on best behaviour so they don't get fined. And that best behaviour is following the broadcasting code, which everyone else does. That's Yeah, that's true. But this is specifically around the politicians as presenters ruling which I think is slightly different which um, they have had in place since the Mm. beginning and they have said they're going to stick to and I think as a point of principle they don't consider that there is any issue with present with serving politicians acting as impartial um, news presenters 
Well, they don't call it news. Well, we're we're news. kind of getting into this real world of, of what is news. Mm. Like the BBC don't like, seem to know what is news anymore, and now GB News obviously is GB News news. Well, the lines or are blurring news. for us, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it is getting you know, uh, uh, but I think that they are being intentionally blurred for these for these reasons, and 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 that is you know that's obviously what is that Charleston in a general election year? Yeah, well, this is the thing. I I think that that's the real test because because if if my maths are, aren't aren't wrong. If my maths are right, <laughs> um, GB News hasn't been on air during an election campaign. No. Mm. Um, and, and I think that they'll have to pull all those presenters, right? You know, but once we get into an election period, and, you know, the mayor elections are coming up in, in London, and that's going to... And local elections are around Local the elections are coming around the corner. And how, and how is that all dealt with? Do they have to, you know, like take all those presenters down? And let's be honest, the figures seem to demonstrate that that's actually only those those politicians, serving politicians, are actually bringing in the audience in the first place. It is place. worth noting that actually Esther McVeigh and Philip Davis gave up their show when Esther went up into the cabinet. Mm. And so it's actually only Rhys Mogg that's now a serving politician that's on the books because that was against the rules and they did abide by that. And Lee... Yes. Think, Lee Anderson. Lee Anderson, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, James, in Australia, the old boss of GB News used to run Sky News Australia. Um, how does that do? Because that's in a similar mould. Yeah, it is in a similar world. I, I mean, I should say that we get GB News in Australia as well. It's popped up on both uh, on both pay, pay TV uh, channels uh, there. The ad breaks are full of promos saying seven o'clock on Saturday, which of course makes absolutely no sense whatsoever <laughs> if you're watching it in Australia. So I'm not quite sure what's uh, what's going on there. Sky News Australia does incredibly well in terms of setting the agenda. Mm. Um, it's not available on terrestrial TV in the capital cities. Uh, it is available on t- terrestrial TV outside of that, and of course it's on uh, Foxtel as you would as you would expect. No, uh, it's got ex politicians hosting it, but no current politicians, uh, which is there. I, I think it's important to remember that there's no impartiality rules in, in Australia at all. So Sky News Australia is, um, uh, I mean, it's more far right than Fox News is, you know, in the US. It's a, it's quite a watch. Um, so GB and News is the voice of reason in Australia. So, I mean, well, I mean, uh, so as a result, everybody assumes that the ABC is is far left, whereas actually the ABC is m- middle ground, but it looks far left in comparison to, um, you know, the big uh, AM talkback stations, 2GB, but also Sky News. So, yes, absolutely. Uh, one of the big stories of the year has been about cuts to BBC local radio programming. Chris Burns is the head of audio and digital for BBC England and responsible for 39 local radio stations. Uh, we sent broadcast consultant Paul Robinson to speak with her this week and they began by discussing how the plan's going. Well, we've set our target across the whole of BBC local that we want to reach 50% of the population in England. So that's our target. And that would include TV, online, social and sound sign-in. So that's what we're looking to do. I mean, at the moment, if you were to take our local radio stations, what we do online and what we do in terms of our TV programmes, I mean, our 6.30 programmes that are still broadcast are the most watched TV news programme the BBC produces. So, you know, we're not doing badly in lots of areas, but we believe we can genuinely grow that even more than we've currently got. I think we're in most places now about 45%. But, you know, we need to set a stretch target. I think that's the right thing to do. And if we are actually resourcing those areas like social properly, uh, like looking at how we're developing what our proposition is going to be on sounds, how we develop the local rail, how we develop sport more, you know, um, you know, is there more we can do in terms of the long read on sport? Uh, because of all the commentary has got, there's probably more we can do there. I think if we use all of those levers at our disposal, we can actually touch more people. Change is always difficult, and you've come in for some criticism for the changes you've made. What would you say to those people who have been critical, maybe, of the most recent changes at BBC Local Radio? I was on a walk uh, in Northampton in November. It was um, a children in need walk. Uh, And I was walking with a group of Radio Northampton listeners. And they didn't necessarily know know who I was at the start of the day. And as we walked, obviously, when you're walking for six hours, you talk. And I explained what my role was. And they talked to me a lot about what they thought of the um, current changes. And one woman was saying to me, she was describing how intimate the relationship with the radio was. And I said to her, I said, 
it, does it feel as if somebody's come into your living room and rearranged the furniture? She said, that's exactly how it feels. I said, right, I understand that. And I explained what we were trying to do. And she said, well, that makes sense. I understand what you're trying to do, but I still want these things. And I said, look, I think what we have to do is we've introduced a lot of change in a relatively short space of time. I think we will need to look at that. We may need to go back and tweak some things. Have we got everything right? I think it would be arrogant of me to sit here now and think, well, that was the per- that's the perfect plan. We don't need to look at anything. Of course we will look at things. We need to look at the audience measures. We need to look at what's working, perhaps what's not working, and we will tweak accordingly. Because creativity... And radio should always be iterative. You should always be growing. You should always be developing. I mean, I'm sitting here uh, today, you know, listening to Greg James talking about um, how he uses the audience, listening to Mariana Spring and how she builds trust amongst some of the people who've got some very deep-rooted and personal things to talk about. But there were lots of things that I've noticed today that we all share in common. And I think this is where we need, to, we need to be true to a series of principles. We do need to listen to the audience and we do need to be bold enough to react. We also need to be authentic. We need to give prominence to the stories and we need to hear from the audience and use the audience more within our programming and put them at the front and centre of everything that we do. But I also believe that we will be stronger in local, if we use all the platforms at our disposal. You've talked about news, you've talked about the local rail, you've talked about local radio. Let's talk about podcasts. And one of the successes is Love Bombed, made by Radio Newcastle. What are your thoughts about future podcasting and how will you leverage that sort of production expertise that exists in those 39 local radio stations to create podcasts for BBC Sounds? So I think what we need to find, I think, in local are what are the things that we can deliver that no one else can deliver. For me, it's stories of the place and giving them greater prominence. So things like Love Bombed, also the kidnapping of Stephanie Slater. You know, those are stories where actually the reporting team in those areas have built a bond of trust, which means that people are much more likely to talk to you and talk freely and really trust you to develop that story. I think there is more potentially we can do around sport and you know how we really kind of dial up the fandom element which again we could be much more partisan than other areas of the BBC and there's also probably something we can do more around you know my moment in history Uh, we did a series a couple of years ago now around the Falklands and it was made by BBC Radio Solent they went to the Falklands but also it was the story of the soldiers who went out there. The people who were on the Falklands, and one woman, it still lives with me uh, forever, she told the story about how she went to school on the Friday and she was being taught in English. She went on the Monday and she was being taught in Spanish. And it's a connection with the place that means we are best able, I think, to bring those stories to life. And those are stories that are very much rooted in local, but they've got a national, and in some cases, an international appeal. Could you maybe sort of confirm, because I think people have quite asked, I think people asked the question really, are you, as the BBC, committed to local radio? Will local radio still be around in five, ten years' time? I, I, I'm absolutely committed to local radio. I want us to have strong local radio stations. You know, there are lots of different things we could have done, but the fact that we still have 39 local radio stations across the whole of England. And I I learnt during COVID one thing very early on. The story of COVID was different from place to place. There was the story in Cornwall, there was the story in Newcastle, there was the story in Leicester, which was not the same as the story in Nottingham and Derby. Mm. So keeping those 39 bases is absolutely vital. But I do think we need to see those local services being local production hubs, because that way, you know, what you will see across the BBC is audiences will see their lives reflected back. And that is something I believe local can deliver. Chris Burns, thank you very much. Thank you. 
That was Chris Burns speaking to Paul Robinson this week at Radio Days Europe. Our thanks to them. Uh, James, uh, what did you think of what uh, she had to say? Yeah, I thought it was interesting, her target of 50% of the population of England um, uh, listening to or watching consuming. or consuming. Uh, of course, that includes TV. And she's currently on 12% just on local radio. Um, did, she didn't mention podcasts. She only mentioned BBC Sounds. So any of this fancy money that will be coming into the podcasts don't actually matter there. Um, the one thing that I did notice, so I thought, I thought, okay, well, she's very much focusing on online here. Um, uh, I, I used to live up in West Yorkshire. I wonder how many news stories have been posted from Leeds today. Went to have a look. Six. And I followed a link. Um, there was one, one story about Bradford. I followed a link. Um, that was marked Bradford and I got a page from the BBC website that was last updated in March 2015 so I thought yikes there's a there's a thing it's but it's interesting that they're trying to they're trying to change an audio organization into a broader digital organization mm. and they've obviously mm. lo lost a, a lot of staff which is very sad mm. the ambition to reach 50% with BBC with BBC Live content isn't a bad one but as you kind of point out, that it's it's a it's a big challenge to make that work. Well, and also crucially, we the public won't get to see those other measures because we mm. get to see radio, and I can point to to twelve percent, and 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 there we are. But in terms of the BBC Sounds data, in terms of um, in terms of podcasts, in terms, frankly, of you know some of the regional TV stuff, it's much harder to actually work out how close they're getting. So we almost have to just um, assume that they are telling us the truth when they give us some of these um, some of these uh, numbers. So I do look at that, and I and I'm you know I shake my head a little bit. But I have to say, some of the changes in local radio are needed, mm. and um, they haven't. Um, handled them well at all um, but if you have a look at how local radio works in most other markets um, the, the BBC is moving a little bit closer into into that kind of area uh, and we'll be back with more media news after this So, retrospectors, what historical events are we ticking off on this week's run of Today in History? Well, Monday is the anniversary of the day a Japanese inventor helped blind people cross the street. Then on Tuesday, we tell the epic tale of Barcelona's La Sagrada Familia. On Wednesday, the day the French blamed the Black Death on astrology. Thursday was the day the last prisoners left Alcatraz. And on Friday, we revisit the opening of SeaWorld. But where's baby Shamu? We discuss this and more on Today in History with the Retrospectors. Ten minutes every weekday, wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back, friends. James and Alex are here with more news in brief. A couple of Channel 4 stories for you. Uh, this week, the top team were awarded bonuses, but at a reduced rate. Uh, last year, their bonuses were waived. Um, Faraz Broadcasting Union, Beck2, calls it a slap in the face. Is it? Yeah, it feels a little bit tone deaf. Uh, there was part of the statement said that it was it was about kind of the best talent retention, um, while they're mm. also making redundancies at the best at, at, at the current time. And you know, the TV industry is 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 having a real moment, to put it politely. Um, and a lot of TV producers like myself are really, you know, honestly struggling. It's, mm. it's really hard to get work. And so when you see money being spent on remuneration packages um, that is that is rewarding you know, is giving bonuses for performance, but it doesn't look like the performance is great. I think one of the things that I would say about this is that it's it's quite easy to have quite a, a knee-jerk reaction to, oh my God, they're getting bonuses and that's not fair. I always say that, look, I don't really care how much any media organisation gets paid, you know, to at the top. So long as they are creating commissions and creating opportunities for people like like myself and other production companies and and the freelance community so that's where it feels like it's it's uneven right now i i think that you should get rewarded as a commercially you know as a public service broadcaster but it's, it's commercially led if you can t continue to grow the channel and continue to bring in more income into that channel that allows you to spend more money on programs then yes of course you should be rewarded for that because the whole industry benefits it's difficult to see that happening here and and it, i think a bit more scrutiny is to kind of why you get awarded bonuses is is required and a bit more transparency if they got those bonuses they should be saying we got these bonuses because of xyz mm. we didn't get our full bonuses because of xyz that's not the messaging that i've seen come out should they um recalibrate their bonuses to sort of reigniting the tv industry well i mean i think that the bonuses should exist to mm. to to ignite the, the tv industry at, at all times i, I don't mm. think there should be any any discrepancy there um, but but I I think what you're suggesting is that they use that money and put it into commissioning more programs. 
my view is yes of course commissioning programs commissioning more creativity getting more stuff to audiences should always be the priority over exec pay I, i'd be quite surprised if anybody disagreed mm. with that um but I, I just again this is another case of honestly channel 4 being a bit tone deaf in in what's going on in the market and and then having to release these statements i know they need to do it they need to enumerate people the annual report's coming out they need to get ahead of it they need to put the statements out but i think they could be a bit smarter in how they how they suggest it alex this week also saw dairy girls writer uh, lisa mcgee uh, take her latest project to netflix um why did channel 4 uh get out of that deal i think there was some agreement between um lisa channel four and channel four that um this upcoming comedy thriller she's working on how to get to heaven from belfast had kind of morphed into something that it wasn't quite in development mm. now that's some and, and netflix came in and was prepared to fund it they thought that's a good idea for us now you know things get put into development all the time um they don't always end up at the broadcaster that invests in them in the first instance obviously lisa mcgee's got a great relationship with um channel four through years and years of of, of the uh, outstanding dairy girls and so there was an expectation that that show would end up with four but you know as for as was saying, Channel 4 is in tough times. It's got to think carefully. You know, Netflix isn't necessarily flush with money at the mm. moment. But, you know, so arguably, you know, we should be celebrating the fact that Lisa's still able to get shows away no matter where they are. For us, is it just one of those things or does it look to something else being problematic? Well, this show in particular going to Netflix. Yeah. I, listen, I think that we are in a market and uh, I actually kind of welcome this. I think that we should have as many customers as possible mm. trying it's to good buy UK a bit of a content. More. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, and, and I, I, you know, is it the best news for Channel 4? I don't think it's like the Black Mirror story. So for, for people of um, a, a greyer hair complexion than 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 myself. Well, actually, I'm in that I'm in that camp now. Let's be honest. But but there was a lot of story about how people Channel can 4... see the YouTube for us. <laughs> no, I thought, get away with it. But um, but cha- the, you know, Channel Four obviously kicked off Black Mirror. Charlie Brooker took it to them, and it was it was a massive hit for Channel Four. And then there was a bit of a kerfuffle because Netflix swooped in and and effectively bought created a production company and bought the production company from Charlie and 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 Black Mirror along. And that, that came because Channel Four at that point, and it was a whole sort of different group of people that made that decision uh, but they sort of forced charlie to get some co-funding then it all sort of fell apart and so he took it to netflix yeah and i i would argue that the brand is the black mirror brand mm. is much better as a result and viewers who are subscribers to netflix mm. are, are getting much better shows as a result because it's an incredibly expensive show because effectively it's a film every episode it's a completely brand new story and i don't think it would have been sustainable for a public service broadcaster. Mm. But let's uh, not paint it as poor old Channel 4. Let's not remember, it wasn't too long ago that um, Channel 4 came in and um, poached, the, poached Bake Off from mm. BBC, and Toss poached Master. Taskmaster mm. from Dave. I mean, they say that that is kind of instantly profitable for them, though. Yeah. So sure. that's a good business deal because it's cash straight in. It's a place that they can show off their own uh, their own programming. Um, but obviously, we've talked about it in the past, it does sort of point to a bit of a creative gap in what the next hit shows are. Um, right, elsewhere, uh, YMU has been sold again, uh, this time to private lending company Pamira Credit as part of a wider deal with their parent company. Uh, YMU, uh, Alex, like an, it's an agency, uh, isn't it? They look after a lot of people. Um, there's some production in there as well. Um, they had pretty high debt. How are things now with them? Um, I think... Uh, it'll be interesting to see how this deal unfolds. They have got a lot of high-profile talent. Simon Cowell, Graham Norton, Claudia Winkleman. You know, it'll be interesting to see. Obviously, agencies are built on the talent that they've got. Um, you know, M&A always creates change and movement. And, you know, it'll be crucial for YMU to hang on to that talent in order for Premiera to realise its value. Uh, for us last year, um, Schofield was the name that was mentioned probably the most uh, with YMU. Obviously, never heard of him. Uh, obviously, not with them anymore. Uh, but now they've expanded shits and gigs. Uh, Amelia de Moldenberg, a lot more digital first talent. Um, is that where it's got to go for, for agencies? I think YMU's been a, quite an interesting company from, from the outside because it has... It, it's it's not just a talent agency, and I think they've always pitched themselves as being more than just a talent agency. So they have invested heavily in both creating their own content and and building brands, and that seems to be the trend across lots of talent agencies. Insanity have done a really really good job of it as well, where they've actually created almost like a whole podcast wing, where a lot of their talent is making some really great podcasts um, through through their partnerships team at, at Insanity. Um, and I think that there there are other, there are many other talent agencies that are doing the same that they see themselves as creators, not just the you know the agents for creatives and uh and and so ymu it feels and you know i haven't got the numbers to this but kind of anecdotally from the outside it feels that ymu were a bit more aggressive in this space and trying to get a lot more 
trying to make a lot more content and and be seen in in that world it, you know how, how successful they've been in that they've been in a changing space so you know there was a podcast boom that mm. slowed down right now there is a digital boom is is that going to continue or is that starting to slow down right now but there are always breakthrough talent as you mentioned and and the game i think for talent agencies is to get to that talent first and fresh rather than signing them later on when they become very expensive james kind of podcasting there's been a bit of coverage recently about how every announcement has a big name attached to it mm. uh is that essential to have a successful show and so does it make these talent agencies who are involved in production a little bit as well uh, be in a really good place. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly makes it easier to market a big show is, is if you have a big name, you know, attached to it. I, I found it interesting. Um, there's a company called Cast Media that um, just filed for bankruptcy in the US and um, and I bought, I, I spent actual US dollars in buying their bankruptcy papers so that I could see who they were owing money to. And what I found fascinating is they own somewhere in the region of six point something million um, you know US uh, dollars um, but a lot of the talent who they were uh, who, the, who they owe money to seems to be you know name of company care of UTA and oh. UTA big uh, agent of course in in the US and you, you know so so all of a sudden you can actually see that they have inserted themselves into these deals in a way that you know, um, possibly you wouldn't necessarily have expected, you know, um, uh, to end up seeing. So, yeah, I think, um, and I find it, you know, again, interesting that the podcast show in London uh, in a couple of months' time, that will have speakers from some of the large um, some of the large agencies, and they are bringing their their talent along to actually hawk those as well. Uh, okay, just enough time for the media quiz. This week entitled... Can you be more specific? I'll give you a headline that could come from any episode of the media podcast. Uh, this is producer Matt is most cynical, everybody. Uh, and you try to <laughs> fill in the details for this week in particular. So buzz in with your names if you know the answer. So Faraz, you'll Faraz. say. Faraz. Sorry, I'll say it again. Faraz. Alex will say. <laughs> Alex. And James will say. James. Uh, here we go. Let's play. Can you be more specific? Number one, BBC apologises. Alex. Yes. This is... <laughs> you have to think there, like, which of all of the things? <laughs> this is the story about the... B yeah, what does it... What's it apologise for lately? Yeah. <laughs> it's got a lot to apologise for. Um, no, this is the story about it um, calling the Reform Party far right mm. in its copy. Um, so uh, there was a, a report about the um, political party. I think it's a political party organisation in which on the BBC News website in a run by Richard Tice and it was described as uh, far right. Now, it subsequently emerged that they'd take an agency copy right. which had described the, the business, the, uh, Tice's uh, organisation as such. Um, the, the agency submitted a correction. The correction wasn't taken in. You know, it's a process thing. Mm. Uh, mistakes happen. And they weren't the only ones to do it, were they? Yeah, the, the Jake Cantor said that, that Daily Mail did the same thing. Mm. Like, because they were using agency copy, yeah. though, you see, not because it was the same people making the same mistake. It was mm. one, someone at PA, poor sod, dropped mm. the ball, <laughs> used the wrong phrasing, got picked up around the world, they retracted it. Other organisations were slower off the mark. What they're is... not far wrong in saying that they're slower. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a question like, what is far right? What is right? What is far right? What, what is, what's his what's news? viewpoint? What's, what's a fact and what's a viewpoint? <laughs> uh, okay, question number two. Uh, well done, Alex. Point for you. Question number two. Channel 4 confirms experienced head of department to leave. Faraz. Although yes. there's, there's like three of them. I'm going to go with... <laughs> well, I get, I, I've got two, so if you can get both of them. Well, there's three there's now. Three. Oh, okay. There's three now. So, so Carl Warner, who's the head of youth um, mm -hmm. and E4... Um, I think was the first he's, to be announced, and then from he's been there, there about six years, I think. Yeah, he's been he's been there for a, he's, yeah he's been mm. you know looking after role, E4 yeah. since pretty much um, for a while, and then Alf Laurie um, was announced last week, and then I think today Caroline Hollick, who's the head of drama, was announced. Um, so there's there's everything comes in three in telly, so there's there's your three, but they are I would argue three incredible creatives, and and I think a, a real loss to Channel Four. Uh, Caroline was of course before uh, Caroline was of course behind It's a Sin. Yeah. Uh, some points for you there we'll work yeah. on that later right so question number three uh, new presenter confirmed on long running news program oh. Alex Alex yes Emma Barnett correct so oh. this is the news that uh, Emma Barnett currently hosts Women's Hour uh, for BBC Radio 4 she'll be uh, setting the alarm clock a little bit earlier because mm. she's going to be doing the Today program shock uh, Martha Kearney Martha Kearney announced she's going to be stepping back, I think, after the general election. Mm. And I think Emma's um, stepping up. 
in pretty the, soon. I think April, yeah. April May. Yeah, uh, yeah. James, good decision having Emma on the stay yeah, program. I think so. She, she, uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, a younger, a younger voice. Um, you know, one that will be familiar to Radio Four audiences. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a great reporter. So it'll be mm. interesting to see how she does there. So well done, uh, Alex. Um, you've won the quiz. Uh, you get to uh, investigate how far right the Reform Party are. Please uh, come back uh, with your thoughts. Uh, my thanks to Fraz Osman, James Cridland, and Alex Farber. Uh, James, where can people keep up with you and your travels? Oh well, um, I write a uh, daily newsletter all about podcasting and and on demand. It's free and it's available in your email inbox. Podnews.net. That's Podnews.net. Uh, for us, uh, I'm Fosman on Instagram. Goldweller is gold underscore Waller everywhere. We've got a doc out on BET and My Five at the moment called Garms, which I'm really proud of. Um, and yeah, anybody that wants some stuff made, give me a call because I want to uh, make it. Uh, you know where to find him. Uh, and Alex, how can people follow your excellent journalism? Uh, well, just subscribe to the Times. Good digital packages available and available in all good news agents. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Uh, thank you all. Uh, remember, this 25% off your first booking at the London Podcast Studios, where we record our show each week. Uh, that's when you use the code MEDIAPOD. So just head to thelondonpodcaststudios.com. That's thelondonpodcaststudios.com for 25% off using the code MEDIAPOD. Uh, if you're new to the show, make sure you hit follow on your podcast app of choice. Uh, my name is Matt Deegan. The producer was Matt Hill. It was a Rethink Audio production. Uh, I'll see you soon.